Hello, and thank you all so much for coming um, to this thinking, which, as Mark said, is my first. So please, please do be kind. Um, so my colleague, Giles Wittell, did a, a London grad thinking a couple of months ago. And when we first planned this, I was slightly worried we'd have little new to talk about. But um, it has been a busy couple of weeks, especially here on the Lebedev desk at Tortoise. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we had this really, I thought, extraordinary moment in Parliament where the Prime Minister was asked about a particular meeting he had with Alexander Lebedev, um, which for four years he refused to admit to, and he finally did. Um, and I'd like us to get back to that moment at some point this evening. But before we get there, I thought we could do a sort of mini tour of London grad, so that once we do get to that moment, we're on very stable and informed ground. Um, and we are lucky to be joined with us in the newsroom by Susan Coftry, who is at the Foreign Policy Center and has done a lot of work on um, the sort of legal industry that serves oligarchs. And I think with us in Colorado <laughs> is Bill Browder. So, Bi so Bill, on the off chance that you don't know, is um, or was Russia's largest foreign investor until he was expelled in 2005, six-ish, I think, quite dramatically. Um, and I thought, Bill, we could start, we could start with you, um, if that's okay. Uh, I think one, one of the really interesting things about London is it's never only been about Russian money here, that over years, decades, even we've had these very different waves. You know, the Americans coming with a lot of money, then the Arabs, and then the Russians. But there's something um, qualitatively different about the oligarchs. What, what, what is that, Bill? What, what is it about them that should concern <coughs> us? Well, so, so let, let's just start out by um, understanding why all these people come to London. So if you're a um, kleptocrat um, uh, in a dictatorship, whether it's Russian or Chinese or in some Middle East dictatorship, um, in your country, um, there is no property rights or rule of law. And so whatever money that you've accumulated in, in your country, um, you can't be confident that that money is going to be yours next year or in five years time. And so um, all of these people, um, decide, have decided to look for safe places to put their money. So they steal money in their own countries, um, do terrible things to steal their money, often kill, hostage take, etc. And then they want a place where they know their money is secure. And uh, if you look around the world, one of the great things that Britain offers everybody is a rule of law and property rights. And But th uh, there are other countries with rule of law and property rights, but the, the really special advantage of London is that um, they can be almost 100% sure that if the money is the proceeds of crime, that nobody will investigate it in the UK. There will be no prosecution. You won't have to explain the source of your dirty money. And since Russians, um, almost, I, I would say that nearly every dollar of money that belongs to Russians has come from some sort of crime, um, uh, it's, it's a very attractive place to be. And so over 22 years since Putin came to power, and maybe even before he came to power, um, Russians came to London. And, and I would argue that London is to Russia as Hong Kong was to China. It's like the major offshore center for, for Russians. And you can see that in all those statistics you put up um, uh, before this started, and you can see that in every other way in which, um, in which um, Russians have, been, have become a fixture in every, in every different way in, in yeah. London life. Why, why are they so confident that um, this illicit money they bring over won't be investigated? What is it about, about London's institutional setup? Well, they're, they're confident because there never has been a single prosecution um, for economic crimes coming out of Russia in 22 years. <laughs> just, it's, um, it really is, they're, they're, they're uh, you know, it's just, they're, they're, it's just, I guess the, lawyers and, and, uh, and intermediaries that are advising them on where to keep their money safe have told them 
you know, nobody's going to ask any questions here and nobody has asked any questions. So the, um, the lawyers are a really big part of this. And I think in, in many ways they've evaded the kind of scrutiny that was applied to, to the bankers, um, PR agents, real estate agents. Now, Susan, you've, you've done a lot of work um, in that massive and extremely clever report in front of you. What, could you describe what the legal services industry is like here and how they work with oligarchs? Sure. Um, I mean, I think the reason that we haven't heard about sort of legal intimidation and, and what we call slaps, which are strategic lawsuits against public participation, it's a, a term that originated um, from US academics in the early 90s, and there's been a long history in the US of anti-slap campaigns, um, and more recently in Europe, uh, largely thanks also to the work that Paul and his family have been doing. Um, but it's, it, it's this kind of legal intimidation which is intending to shut down public scrutiny and criticism. So information that's in the public interest and preventing it from coming into the public domain. And what we have seen is that um, as well as being a hub for the facilitation of um, financial crime and, and sort of money laundering uh, here in London, there are also services, namely law firms, that also support the reputation laundering by uh, removing information that's uncomfortable for, uh, for those uh, who, who may have been in the recipient of, of, of illicit funds. Um, and uh, making sure that, that that doesn't reach the public domain, which might then get into due diligence systems or flag people as politically exposed persons or just, you know, generally mark them as ne'er-do-wells that uh, we should be careful of. And mm. instead, what happens is that that information doesn't make it into the public domain, doesn't make it to law enforcement agencies or, you know, these due diligence systems. And therefore, they're able to, to operate in a way that's... Um, hidden. And the, the legal system in the UK, unfortunately, operates in such a way that supports that uh, hidden process. So I think a lot of people have heard of slaps in the last year because of the quite public high profile cases taken against journalists like Catherine Belton, Tom Burgess and Carol Cadwallader. But all these cases start with letters initially, which are written by law firms to and by the way, slaps are not just taken against journalists, but in this context, and that's my research, is, is on, on media. And, and, you know, Paul knows very well and has been in the uh, recipient of many a legal letter. And that's where they, that's where they start. Um, so, you know, he's doing a good job. They never uh, go anywhere, I should say. Yeah, <laughs> because he's doing a good job. So, um, Susan is an independent guest. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but a fully signed up member of the fan club. Oh, so, that's okay. you know. um, but yeah, I think um, it, this process has been hidden because these letters come marked private confidential, strictly not for publication. And journalists, you know, like Paul, they're putting questions, uh, they're trying to get information, they want the, you know, the response from the person <coughs> that they are um, putting those questions to, the, the subject of their investigation, um, and a right to reply. Uh, but instead, they're just being diverted uh, almost immediately. Increasingly, this is this journalist that I spoke to for this report. It was, was so common now that they are being hit immediately with a legal letter or a legal threat, uh, and then they're sort of, you know, taken down this sidetrack where they've got to deal with these letters. And there's a lot of onus in the current uh, system. Um, in our legal system mm. on how the journalists behave and, and that is important it's important for for journalists to um, to take proper kind of you know uh, care when doing their investigations but there's very little attention paid to yeah. their behavior of law firms and um, the tactics used uh, and who you know the, their claimants so that's something we, we want to because you yeah. have a lot of examples in yeah. your report could you could you give us one so a really Egregious one. Well, I mean, <laughs> there are quite a lot of egregious ones. Um, I mean, in the in the report, the report um, tries to highlight the problems with the UK legal system through examples. So it's pulled out different elements of cases to show the challenges that journalists have to overcome in order to um, to sort of deal with these legal threats. And um, it, one of the court cases which was only two, two years ago, but hasn't had the same level of, sort of public attention as that of Paul Radu. 
So Paul Radu is the co-founder of the Organised Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, which is behind many of these. I'm sure if you're members here, you probably know exactly who OCCRP but are, but they have done a lot of these global investigations into these illicit financial flows. Um, and he is a Romanian citizen working for a US registered organization. Um, and he was sued by an Azerbaijani businessman and sitting MP at the time um, for you know, reporting that was covering issues in, in Azerbaijan. Now, why was that case brought here? Um, and what was the bar that, that allowed uh, the Azerbaijani businessman um, to build a reputation here in order to you know, be able to utilize the UK legal system? Um, well, he was able to do that, and uh, you know, he had property here, and he had family here. Um, and interestingly, that case went on for almost two years before it settled on the eve of the trial. Uh, the claimant decided to withdraw the case because OCCRP had continued reporting and continued digging up information. And through the process of disclosure, which happens in, in the UK legal system, they had to reveal that prior to the trial. And the claimant thought maybe, maybe not going to go what through with the, this. What were the legal costs like? Up to so, this? I, I mean, every case uh, that's taken to uh, speaking to, to, to lawyers um, who, who take these kind of media cases, they say to defend a case of trial <coughs> at a floor costs half a million pounds at the floor. Um, and, you know, at that point, OCCRP had, you know, had to resource mm -hmm. all of those costs. But then, um, you know, they, they had a settlement. Uh, they took the settlement. The information stayed online. But then in two years later, the beginning of this year, the National Crime Agency seized, successfully managed to seize 5.5 million, I believe it was, from the family members of the person that had sued him. And they had used OCCRP's original investigation into Azerbaijan, and they had also used the information that had come through uh, during the court case. And so that, inf that investigation was about how um, billions of money had been uh, funneled out of Azerbaijan through four UK shell companies um, about a decade ago during a time of... An, really quite considerable cla you know, clampdown mm. on civil liberties there, arrests of journalists, including one of the journalists who worked on the Azerbaijan laundromat investigation. So um, that's probably um, one of the most kind of yeah. obvious cases where you see not only what could have happened to the media outlet if they had not um, been able to defend that case, the information you know, wouldn't have stayed in the public domain, wouldn't have made it to the law enforcement authorities, um, but then it still took two years uh, for a civil process for, us, for some of the asset recovery. Um, and that's what we're talking about, the, this, not just the you know, impact on individual journalists, mm. but also the incredible impact on society's right to know about these issues and, and, and the redress for them. Yeah, so Tortoise, so I know one of the firms you looked at was Shillings, um, and Tortoise had had an issue with shillings. So before the Lebedev reporting, the first, I suppose, London grad piece we did was about a member of the Lords called Greg Barker, who for a long time chaired Oleg Deripaska's company. Um, now the amazing, the amazing thing about him is the report was all about how he lobbied against US sanctions on this company, which is listed on the LSE, by the way. But it, it really, it wasn't that that upset Greg Barker. It was a little bit on a portrait painting he had commissioned of himself. So this enormous oil uh, portrait, really life-size, you know, two meters by a meter and a bit, of him in um, full fox hunting gear um, for his house. <laughs> and, um, at a time when he was a like, 30 year old MP. Um, and, we, and we reported on it and it was incredible, it was this visceral reaction. We started getting one letter after another from Shillings, which is fine, I think. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, not, maybe not for tortoise, because this matters. Your, your insurance premium goes up, even if it goes nowhere. But the really, but the really amazing thing about, about Shillings, I thought, in this context, was that they, um, they started writing to the portrait painter who went on the record in the piece, so they obviously knew who he was, 
and, and threatened to sue him unless he um, signs a statement where he disavows everything he's told me on the record so that they can then take that statement and bring it to us and say, look, your article is false, defamatory, and all the rest of it. And I thought, like, what an extraordinary thing for, for lawyers to do whose first obligation is, is to, the, to the rule of law. Um, Not to make it just yeah. about shillings, but another example that's in the report is a few years ago, um, two American journalists were publishing a, a book about... Um, the 1MDB scandal, which is a scandal where Malaysia's sovereign wealth fund was, was plundered. And um, one of the um, master, supposed masterminds, who's currently on the run from four states of justice, yeah. <laughs> like four countries of justice, Joe Lowe, Joe Lowe yeah. Um, Shillings wrote to booksellers all over the world, threatening them with uh, libel if they sold the book or even, you know, had the uh, little description um, yeah. of what the book was about um, uh, in, in preparation of publishing it. So to take that kind of action um, and to have booksellers <laughs> trying to respond. Yeah, uh, it was pretty extreme, that case. Um, so so the, lawyers, the lawyers obviously work hand in glove with a lot of other... Um, people in London, so intelligence professionals, uh, people who do surveillance, for example. And I wonder if we go to Bill. Sorry, I'm not even sure where to look. <laughs> um, Here I am. So, so Bill, you, um, you had given evidence to, the, to Parliament's Intelligence and Security Committee, so when it was doing the Russia report. Could you talk a bit, or to the extent you can, about um, this economy of, of intelligent types in London, what they do, where they come from? Yep. So, so um, uh, I'm, I'm the person who's responsible for getting the Magnitsky Act passed in the United States, UK, and 34 countries. And um, Vladimir Putin has really been hugely angry at me for doing that because it puts his offshore fortune at risk and the offshore fortune of oligarchs that are very close to him. And since the first Magnitsky Act was passed in 2012, um, there's been a major Russian government project to go after me all over the world, um, starting with death threats, kidnapping threats, arrest warrants. Um, but also um, working with all sorts of uh, lawyers, uh, private investigators, uh, PR firms, uh, filmmakers, um, to do anything they can to try to destroy my life. And so um, just to give you one example, uh, after I was able to get the U.S. Department of Justice to open a criminal money laundering case connected to the uh, murder of my lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, um, the Russian government via uh, proxies, Russia, a Russian oligarch, hired um, a New York lawyer. Um, and of the 58,000 or so lawyers they could have hired in New York, they hired the lawyer who used to be my lawyer looking for the money. So, so the lawyer switches sides. By the way, his name was John Moscow, of all names. And so he, he switches sides. And then the first thing he does um, is he subpoenas me for all of my security records, all of my personal travel records, all of my records of every different sort, all of the records of all my colleagues. And this was the same lawyer when he was working for me who advised me on how dangerous the Russians were and how, how scary it would be to, to put myself in, in harm's way in any way with these people. And um, in addition to um, subpoenaing me, he then hired um, uh, a major uh, investigation firm in the United States. It was called Fusion GPS, run by a guy named Glenn Simpson, um, who then surveilled me, tracked me down um, in various parts of the United States. Um, the Russian oligarchs also hired uh, uh, a security firm in London called GPW to surveil me, track me down, et cetera. Um, and then they started to um, use whatever tools they could come up with to try to defame me 
uh, and sort of to try to reduce my effectiveness in lobbying for the Magnitsky Act all over the world. And they, they made a documentary film about me that they tried to show in the European Parliament and in Washington and various other places. And, um, and basically, um, there was an unlimited budget. And so I would say that for four years or so, I was almost spending all my time, um, every minute, trying to fend off these attacks, you know, not just from Russia, but, but from foreigners, from, from Westerners, who were effectively working as arms of the um, uh, Russian government. And, and, and that's, that was the evidence I gave to the Intelligence and Security Committee in the UK. And the thing about it, which, which is so awful, is that um, there, there were a few things they did that were they were breaking the law, and we've filed complaints about them, but a lot of the stuff wasn't against the law. There was no law in the UK to say that a, that a lawyer or a lobbyist or a PR firm had to register as a foreign agent. Um, uh, in the US, they have something called the FARA registration procedure. Um, and, and there was effectively no law to say that, that um, uh, British people could be agents effectively working as subcontracting agents of the Russian government or Russian security services. And, th that, uh, and so that you had these people who were um, doing this work um, and then you know, show, living in, in 10 million pound houses in Chelsea and getting paid huge amounts of money, sending their wives to the Human Rights Watch Gala and donate a few thousand pounds and all feeling good about themselves. And, and, um, and it's one thing for the Russians to do terrible things, but it's another thing entirely for, the, um, for these Western enablers to do it and to do it without any shame or any embarrassment and be members of, of sort of accepted members of polite society in, in the UK and the US, et cetera. And I, I don't think we're ever gonna um, be able to deviate from this terrible London grad story um, until there's like a real um, you know, shame, both legal, economic, and otherwise for these people to do what they do. So can we, can we now sh um, shame some of those people? So the firm you mentioned, GPW, who, who works for it? Because it is significant, the kind of people who go on to do this work. Well, as far as I'm aware, there's, there was an individual um, who is um, a former, uh, former MI5 or MI6 agent who was working there. And, um, uh, and, and to give you another example, um, uh, Lord Goldsmith, the former Attorney General, member of the House of Lords, um, a partner at, a, at an American law firm called Debevoise and Plimpton. Um, he was working for the Russians in this case, getting, and I have a receipt, <laughs> a, a document that leaked that, that he got paid 75,000 pounds to lobby to keep a guy named Andre Pavlov off of, Andre Pavlov is a member of a, of a major organized crime group in Russia. Um, he's sanctioned by many countries. And it was Lord Goldsmith's work um, while he's a member of the House of Lords to um, lobby the European Parliament to try to keep this guy's name off the sanctions list. Um, uh, it's really, I mean, I mean and, and by the way, I could, I could go on and on and on. And John Moscow, the, the lawyer who switched sides and was eventually disqualified um, by, by the um, New York Court of Appeals um, uh, and who did all this stuff trying to chase me down and working for the Russians, he's coming as a welcome member um, uh, to present at the Cambridge, Cambridge University's International Symposium on Economic Crime in September. Um, uh, you know, the, all these people continue to operate and, and um, as if nothing has ever happened. Yeah, I mean, more than any other city, it, it allows people to reinvent themselves quite effectively. And they're also politicians, right? They're also a big part of this. And Bill, you, you remember Greg Barker, I think, for example, again, who's now a conservative member of the Lords. How, how did you first come across him? Well, so, so this guy is a really um, unpleasant character, in my opinion. Um, so I, I first met Gregory Barker long before he was Gregory Barker, Lord Gregory Barker, before he was Minister of Energy Gregory Barker, and before he was MP Gregory Barker. When I first met him, he was the PR agent, P PR representative working for Roman Abramovich in Moscow. I was running a, an investment fund, and we discovered that there were um, financial irregularities in, in um, 
in the uh, company that Roman Abramovich was the majority shareholder of. It was called Sibneft. And so we, um, we went to, um, uh, to the CEO of the company, who was another colleague of Abramovich, his name was Yevgeny Shvidler, and we said, um, we, you know, we don't like what's going on here. We see some financial irregularities which don't look right, and we're shareholders of the company. And so who shows up but um, uh, Gregory Barker, before he's ever lured anything, um, to our office with a bunch of, of videos and slides, um, colorful slides about what a beautiful oil company they had, totally trying to avoid all the questions about the financial irregularities. And I kind of, he was kind of a nobody back then, I, you know, that I viewed him as what they, they, the Russians like to have these British people around, concierge types. And, um, and I kind of um, forgot about him because he was a very forgettable character. And then I noticed, I, I noticed um, like a few, you know, many years later that he was a, an MP and, um, uh, and it didn't really occur to me. I thought, well, that's interesting. Good, good, good on him for somehow transitioning from financial concierge uh, for the oligarchs, for an oligarch to MP. He was then the energy minister uh, um, uh, in, in Cameron's government. And then he becomes a member of the House of Lords. And, and while he's a member of the House of Lords, um, Lord Gregory Barker then becomes the chairman of one of Oleg Deripaska's um, companies that's listed on the London Stock Exchange called EN+. And, and so he, he's, he's now switched oligarchs to be concierge for from Roman Abramovich to um, uh, Oleg Deripaska. And then Deripaska gets put on the US sanctions list. Um, this was in 2017. He gets put on the US sanctions list for being a supporter a sort of integral financial supporter of Vladimir Putin at a time when the US was upset with the Russians uh, hacking the election. And, and at this point, uh, Gregory Barker uh, then gets to work and he shows up uh, as Lord Barker in Washington with a specific mandate to get um, uh, Oleg Deripaska's company off the sanctions list. And he succeeds. And uh, his company, Ian Plus, was taken off the sanctions list. In return for that, he's paid a $5 million bonus. So here you have a member uh, of, of the upper lawmaking chamber in, in the parliament who is um, gone to Washington on behalf of a Russian oligarch to get him off the sanctions list. I mean, I don't think you could, I mean, the, the, the fact pattern there is so damning. And uh, I mean, I can't, I can't believe that that's not illegal. It, it just, it, and, and if it isn't illegal, um, it should be uh, made illegal in the future so that people like that can't do, I mean, you know, whatever his moral compass is, um, we, 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 you know, <laughs> We, we shouldn't rely on that. We should rely on a firm set of rules that doesn't allow that kind of stuff to happen. And by the way, if there are any questions, yes. Can I just jump in? Sorry. Hi, it's um, Tess. Sorry. So just to back up on that, we're talking about a company that was listed yes. on the stock exchange. You know, we're talking about companies that, you know, there was a natural resources boom between what, 2005, 2010. You know, we were bringing copper out of Kazakhstan. We were bringing, you know, silver out of DRC. The, the, the way in which the listing rules allow people mm. with really shady provenance and ownership of, of, of extraction licenses to have come to the LSE, which should be the prime listing entity in the world, that's where this you know, really starts. You've got the magic circle law firms, you've got the investment banks for which I used to work, I apologize right now. Um, you know, they are, uh, these companies are getting listed. How, how are we gonna close that initial circle? Because it's still happening. And we know that London is washing, you know, all sorts of things, but it's still that sort of, um, you know, that badge of respectability, that currency that listing gives you. And, it, and for me, it really starts with, with that. You know, Deripaska's business was a, what, premium listing on the LSE? Come on, you know, anyway, that's just a point. Any more before? Sorry. This is a... Um, possibly a side note, but I suppose the question would be, is it possible to investigate a law firm as powerful and fearsome as shillings properly? Because <laughs> this is, again, 
an aside, sorry, this is a room full of serious and intelligent people, um, except me. So I, I had a running with shillings um, in a previous job. Um, also, I apologise, not an investment bank, but a celebrity gossip magazine, of which I was the publisher for a number of years. And I was frequently receiving letters from all manner of um, legal companies, but our external legal counsel said, you, you, m most of the time it just goes away, except if it's shillings, in which case call me immediately. So there is something about that organisation which is different from all the others. And I, my question is, why? Um, I, I agree with you, and I would <coughs> love to report on shillings, but <laughs> um, the, they have an incredible client base. The, w when you approach these law firms, yeah. Susan, and say to them, um, and raise your concerns with them, yeah. you know, why have you taken on this client? Have you checked where their money, what, what do they say? I, I mean, I think that's the difference between me as a researcher and mm. you as a journalist, because we didn't do that. So um, we took information that was largely in the public domain already and tried to, to really kind of thread a narrative and show that there are these examples and then had the report extremely well legal <laughs> before we published it. Um, and we've not heard, and I hope still not to hear, <laughs> from any of the law firms that we've named. Um, but we felt that the information was already in the public domain. Um, and we were not really raising so much. I mean, we do name the, um, some of the law firms, and Shillings does come up a few times. But we were trying to show how this process works. Um, and it is a process. It's it, uh, filled with different actors. And it's not just individual law firms. And you could arguably say that some of these law firms come up time and time again because that is their area of expertise. You know, they work on media law. They work on reputation management. Fair enough. Um, I think where we have an issue is where we feel that, um, or two parts. One is the tactics they employ. And I think you could speak to some of the very heavy hand, possibly you, <laughs> very heavy handed letters uh, and approaches that get used and smearing information. I'm not saying that specifically about shillings, but this is what we hear from, from, from journalists that receive letters, very aggressively written, um, requiring very tight turnarounds in responses, putting you know, a lot of information in that might not actually be substantive to the, the issue that's at question, and saying that it's, they're going to be sued on various different uh, laws, because it's not just defamation. Often privacy and data protection are increasingly used. Um, and it's basically to just put the fear of <laughs> God into, into journalists and to stop them in their tracks and to delay and you know, obfuscate um, publication. And unfortunately, it, it can work because you know, journalists, um, are, media landscape in the UK and also elsewhere, because a lot of the cases are in the report um, and the research that we've done has been um, speaking to journalists who are abroad receiving letters um, from the UK. And they don't necessarily have the knowledge or the tools or the money to respond. Um, and if they're working to tight budgets, um, you know, getting a lawyer to review a letter that's they've received from a very big law firm, um, and it, it's expensive. So sometimes um, journalists do just concede and, and you know, don't Not take the... others, I should say. But, you know, others have taken the approach, including you, uh, of, of speaking out about it and, and reporting that they've got legal threats. And I think that's really important in dragging this issue into the limelight and also making journalists not feel like they're alone. Um, because you know, big newsrooms will have in-house legal counsel that can see through kind of the bluster of some of these letters um, and respond robustly or not respond at all if they feel you know, this is a real chancer. But it's much harder uh, for, for some smaller journalists, freelance journalists to do that. Um, and w what often happens is you, it, information gets taken out of the story, or the whole story disappears, and nobody knew about what was being written about in the first place, nor the fact that a legal threat even took place. So it kind of happens in this, you know, sort of a, a vacuum, basically. Um, forgotten what the other question was, but I'm no, not sure if it was fine. for me. The, so we got a question um, online. Would you please ask Paul to say something about his investigation into Boris Johnson's visit 
to Alexander, which is why I suppose most people are here. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, are, there, are there questions on this generally? I ca I'm happy to talk about it. I've been talking about it for five months. So, <laughs> um, so okay, so in, um, my editor James asked me to report on Evgeny Lebedev around Christmas time. And um, the world was in many ways very different. Of course, Russia hadn't invaded Ukraine, so I thought it would be a really kind of colorful profile of Evgeny Lebedev. And he is, I mean, he is a real gift to journalists <laughs> because he's, you know, he's got it all. He's very colorful and rich and um, very in with very powerful people. And um, anyway, it was just one of these stories that kept getting weirder and weirder. But um, very early on, it became clear that the story was really about his father, Alexander, who was a very, a quite senior KGB officer and then FSB officer, because he remained in the service until 92. Um, and the money is all his, right? Evgeny, people talk about Evgeny, they say he chose these parties, he bought the newspapers, but the money is his father's. And we looked at the way his father made money, and like a lot of oligarchs of that generation, it came through his KGB links. Um, I mean, he is, he is obviously talented as a banker, but there's no way he would have made that money without having been a, a KGB officer. Um, and the most extraordinary thing, I think, in the reporting is in the fifth episode of this series, London Grad, um, where we reported that Johnson, when he was foreign secretary, uh, made a trip to the, to the Lebedev's Palazzo in Umbria. So they have two places in Umbria, a castle, which they're trying to sell. If you've listened to the podcast, you'll hear, you hear one of my colleagues making inquiries about it. Um, it's on the market for 13 million euros. And, and he asked if there's any, any wriggle room. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, um, and then they have this palazzo where they often host, host Boris Johnson and his friends. And um, the thing is, they, they always bring people over, or normally bring people over, in the second or third week of October. If you look at Johnson's register of hospitality, even going back to his time as mayor, you'll see he always goes in October. So this trip in April really stands out. He locked it in the Foreign Office's hospitality register. And a crucial detail is that he said he went with someone. But we'll, we'll park that for a moment. Um, so it was already really suspicious. Another thing is, it was April 2018. So if you, if you cast your mind back to that period, there were the Skripal poisonings in March. Um, this country expelled a lot of Russian diplomats. You had Maria Zakharova, so Sergei Lavrov's spokesperson, saying the most extreme things about the poisonings. It was really a Russian disinformation overdrive. There were also cyber attacks, which not many people knew about, but it was actually in this Russia report from the ISC. So after the poisonings, there were sustained attacks on, on British government bodies, the Foreign Office being one of them, right? Boris Johnson's Foreign Office. And so a few weeks after all that, he goes to this palazzo. And it was actually reported about a year after, but no one, no one really took notice of it. But the, the puzzle has always been, why? Why did he go then? Why did he go in April? Um, why did he go alone? And if you remember, The Guardian published, again, about a year and a half later, photos of Boris Johnson at Perugia Airport, which is the closest airport, where he looked really hungover. You know, his suit was really crumpled. Um, and, and he was alone, no luggage. So we, the kind of crucial bit we reported on was that um, it was on that weekend that Alexander tried setting up a call um, between Johnson and, and Lavrov uh, to discuss the Skripal poisonings, which I, I first heard it actually in about January, and I thought, that's, that's completely ridiculous. And, you know, then, but it's so good, you know, you, ke you keep at it a bit. So by the time we came to the fifth episode of this podcast, 
I felt like the sourcing was good enough to run it, at least in a careful way. And it was really, it was really amazing because we, I spoke to a lot of really senior diplomats, you know, amb ambassadors, ministers in the foreign office, and they'll all tell you, you know, if they didn't know about this particular issue, they'll tell you that doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> He was, he was just always like that. He said there were, th there were times when we'd look for him, you know, for, for some urgent meeting, and no one would know where he was, <laughs> Britain's foreign secretary. And I thought, that's incredible. Another, another former minister said, it's, it's just so typical of his chummy approach. He was always using friends to do this, to make connections. And I thought, OK, let's, you know, let's just put it to Downing Street. And I, I really didn't know what to expect in return. And I got instead this like completely anodyne statement about Boris Johnson being tough on Russia. And I thought, oh my God, <laughs> they're not even going to deny it. <laughs> um, but the, the other remaining puzzle, which has come up in Parliament, many of you will have seen, is who he went with. And the first, the first time I reported on it, um, I just assumed he, he made a full entry in the register to make it look more normal, you know? He wasn't, he wasn't going to some, some KGB officer turned oligarch's villa alone, <laughs> um, but was going with his family. Um, the, uh, but now, I, I think, I, I, I just think he really did go with someone. And, you know, there are a lot of rumors flying around. Um, Mainly women, you know, he took a woman. He was, he was married to Marina Wheeler at the time. His relationship with Carrie Now Johnson had begun about a month earlier, but was still secret. So I thought maybe it's her. But she, you know, she sent a pretty categorical denial, which of course doesn't mean she wasn't there. <laughs> um, but then, we, we, so we reported this in the, in the latest episode of the podcast. And um, I, got a, I got a call from Gito Harry, who's the Prime Minister's Head of Comms, which was really, really strange, I thought. And he said, you know, this is completely false. You have, it's none of your business who he went with. I said, I th you know, he was the Foreign Secretary. And Harry told me, so what? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, anyway. But then, but then he told me, he told me, um, listen, I took, I took this to the prime minister, uh, who said, who vehemently denies it, and, and said, said he'll he'll sue you, and he said you'll you'll be the first to contribute to his retirement fund, which, <laughs> which in a way is so tragic, because <laughs> because they're all on their way out, and his, um, and and I thought, why why won't you just tell me? But, you know, why can't you just tell me who he went with? And he just wouldn't. Um, so that's the, that's the last piece, I feel, of the puzzle of that meeting. But the, so we spoke to some really, really serious people, one of them Peter Ricketts. So Peter Ricketts is in the Lords now, but he was the UK's first national security advisor. He chaired the Joint Intelligence Committee in Cabinet, and he said, Look, on the basis of what we know so far, this meeting is, is unprecedented, he said, extremely shocking and, and deeply worrying. And I, I hope you listen to the podcast because Peter Ricketts really isn't what you'd call a sensationalist. <laughs> he's, he's really serious and level-headed. And I, I think that the kind of Johnson premiership has been so extraordinary in many ways People lost sight of this meeting. You know, it happened four years ago, and it kind of got lost in all the, in all the mess and all the noise. But, um, you know, of course, tortoise, tortoise wants you to think that it may be, you know, the one thing that comes to define his premiership more than a lot of things, because, of course, you had the parties, you had the wallpaper. And they're, they're scandalous in many ways, but, you know, at the end of the day, the wallpaper... It's really bad, but it's, you know, it's not a national security breach wallpaper. Um, the parties are really bad, a huge breach of trust. But I, I don't know, there's in many ways something really old-fashioned about the scandal. You know, it's very kind of Cold War. 
very wartime. You know, we related it to the Profumo affair. Um, I'm very serious. That's, I think that's what I can say. I, I should check this thing, but if people have any other <laughs> questions about it, yes. I don't want to hog the mic. I know I've already said, said something, but um, Paul, you tell a, a brilliant uh, story. I suppose my question is, like you, mm. th this, the, the, the gravity of this, it did take a while for, to, for it to sink in. Yes. Um, and like you said, the actual meeting itself was reported a while yes. ago, and then it was in the podcast, and people didn't lose their shit when the podcast came out. It took the Prime Minister admitting to it for people to start piecing together um, this. Um, given the, con the sort of geopolitical context, you know, with Russia right now, mm. and the instability of, you know, I'm no Peter Ricketts, I like a bit of sensationalism. I'm going to say the whole, you know, world order. Um, I, it, it, is ex it is both exasperating and frustrating that this issue isn't a bigger deal in the race to succeed him in number 10. It, it doesn't figure almost at all. And you're right to talk about wallpaper and parties. Um, and those things, they sort of figure, they lurk in the background, but really we're talking about tax. Is the, that, that feels to me very much how, how it, it's played out. That seems like it's, sta it's staggering to me that, that this wouldn't be the thing that people are really, really cage rattling about, which is to say the country is rotten, the prime minister has enabled it, and now look, like t the, yes. well, it's just not there. I, I agree, and I don't know if, People want to say something else before I drone on again. So it's not it's not directly related to that. So it's not necessarily a follow on. But okay. in in your um, inquiries, have you looked at? We know who's been at some of the other parties at the same villa over the years. Have you looked at who else was there at that time, that particular 2018 trip? Okay, so. So that's another really strange thing about that trip. You generally know who was at the October ones. And in fact, you know, you can piece together. We, I think by now we can piece together guest lists for, for many of, of the October. So there's the Katie Price one, for example, where you know who, who was there. There are there earlier ones. But this one's really odd because like no one, and we spoke to a lot of people, none of them, none of them knew anything about it. Um, so it may, it may have been smaller, you know, it may have been kind of unplanned. I should say that Boris Johnson, so he went on a Saturday, right? And the, on the Friday, he was in Brussels for a NATO summit. Uh, the first of, you know, where they, where they gather foreign ministers from every NATO member state to discuss Russian malign influence around the world. <laughs> um, um, and he, he urged his counterparts to do more. I mean, imagine <laughs> what they thought when they saw. But the, but the answer is no, which is strange. Um, on, so on, I don't know if there's more, because Liz's point is really important and, and the kind of, is, is in a way, is in a way the, bro the broadest kind of framing of the issue. So I'm, um, so I'm Maltese. Malta inherited, for obvious reasons, um, a British way of government, a very powerful executive, a prime minister with enormous powers of appointment, even in Malta, over the judiciary, certainly over the police force. And for a long time, since 1964, that system of government worked quite well until, until we got a prime minister who really wasn't OK. I mean, hideously, hideously corrupt. Um, and I thought, how incredible that we went so long, you know, half a century, uh, with these rickety, rickety institutions that actually didn't really work at all. Uh, and then they got this test in 2013, and it just fell apart, the system, completely. And in many ways, to a much lesser degree, it's what's happening here, I thought. And when James, my editor, asked me to report on Evgeny, he said, look, this is a corruption story because it's really, we started with Evgeny's peerage, which is, you know, it's nepotism, cronyism. 
um, at the time some people said bribery, but anyway. <laughs> uh, and I thought, I thought that is what's happening. There's this, there's this broader kind of institutional issue. And it's in everything. It's in the power of the executive, the way parliament works, doesn't work, uh, the lawyers, you know, the bankers. And I don't know, I th in, a, in many ways the shock, you had two shocks and you had Boris Johnson in office and then the war in Ukraine. And, you know, before the war in Ukraine, like, people, like, people like Bill um, and Susan, you know, these issues, really no one talked about them. I, I remember campaigning on them and it was really, really fringe to say there's an issue with slaps and there's an issue with these private intelligence firms in London. It was just not there at all. And it's like everything changed overnight. Uh, and I, I guess, I think I imagine these, a, lot of these, a lot of these solicitors firms are gonna have a, a problem because they're unlikely to, to send the kind of letters they used to before Putin invaded Ukraine. And they're unlikely to take on, or they can't actually take on sanctioned oligarchs. Uh, but then when it comes to Johnson and who replaces him, um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know how good, how good that's looking. And um, yes. Well, I just wanted to start off by saying it's a shame that Russian oligarchs don't keep guest books in their overseas villas, because I think that would yeah. make this a lot easier for you. Um, but the, the question I wanted to ask, um, going back to kind of the earlier point, is unique to, I think, politicians like Boris Johnson and Trump, even more so with Trump, and that's, you, there's almost every day a new scandal, and so much so that you, you can't even put your finger on any in particular. It's, it's overwhelming. I, I, I'm curious from a journalistic perspective, what you do in that scenario. If, if a president or a prime minister is, you know, regularly well-tempered and does a good job and then something comes up, you know what to focus on. There's a story there. But if it's happening every night, if it's a new scandal one after the other, how do you, you know, get people to turn their attention to the important ones and how do you decide what the important, the, the <coughs> worst of the worst is? I mean, you... You hope to have an editor is the short answer. <laughs> um, but, the, but it is, I mean, it's thinking in a really self-interested way, it is a really great time to be a journalist, like a really, really great time. Um, you know, it, I was speaking to, a, to one of my editors, Keith Blackmore, who said, this is, this is crazy. I, he said, I never thought in my lifetime he's you know, he's, he's not a young man, Keith. And he said, in, 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 and he's probably watching this, I just remembered. Um, and he said, in, um, he said he'd never thought he'd see anything like this, you know, as a journalist. He'd never thought he'd, he'd be dealing with a story, a kind of national security story involving the then, yes. Sorry. One of the things that sort of staggered me in, the, you know, from the various re revelations that uh, your podcast has revealed, is how how there's not a tripwire been triggered, you know, through these various events um, that that isn't you know somehow triggered something automatic amongst the security services and the uh, government bodies and you know uh, sort of government ombudsman, for want of mm. a better word, um, to really, you know, suddenly kick into action on finding these things, because it appears, at least, that there is at least uh, scope for, um, you know, national security to have been breached to such a degree. If, for instance, if it ha were to have happened, that through uh, Lebedev and... Uh, um, Boris, you know, there was compromise against the Prime Minister uh, or the Foreign Secretary as he was at the time. Um, you know, we, we all remember the whole um, potential compromise uh, story uh, that, uh, bes you know, beset Trump um, and how that, 
huge, you know, became huge. Okay, it was fairly colourful. Um, but, uh, you know, what staggers me is that, that more, that there isn't literally an earthquake happening uh, within I, this country at the moment. It, it, it is a good point. And it gets we to just the, don't know. So it's happened. a problem of institutional setup, right? People wanted, th think of Boris Johnson's ethics advisor, for example. Or, or, the, or the current situation, right? So, so Labour, Labour say, OK, we're really worried about this national security issue. Um, we think there needs to be a, an investigation into this April 2018 trip. But who can they write to? Kit Malthouse, who's the second most senior person in the Cabinet Office after the Prime Minister. And been in the Prime Minister's yes, and, and so and Evgeny, Evgeny's peerage. Um, so the... The House of Lords Appointments Commission, which is a cabinet office body, uh, says, mm, we're a bit worried, let's, let's see what... They actually went to the Met Police um, and the security services, and they were, they were advised not to recommend this appointment, so that's what they did. But what happens? Boris Johnson says, actually, no, <laughs> we're going to do it. So the, you know, in many ways, what, what is the point of that? Appointments Commission. Uh, it, the, prime, the Prime Minister is incredibly powerful, you know, by virtue of his office. His office is incredibly powerful, I mean. Uh, maybe the security services are investigating. I, I don't know. We'll never know. Um, it's a very simple question. Can all this be undone once he's gone? It's a, re it's a really good question. Can it, I, think, I think maybe some of the damage some of the damage, in a way, the kind of fuzzier damage is, is more worrying and permanent, I think. Will people, will people ever really look, look at their cabinet ministers in the same way again? Will people ever trust what a government press officer ever says again? Will people, will people just believe you know, what politicians are saying? And if they stop believing, will they stop participating? And then what happens? You have an enormous problem, I think. Do people feel like institutions are working, even ones as basic you know, as the security services, the police? Um, I don't know. Above my pay grade, I'm afraid. <laughs> but um, it, I, I worry about it. I think I don't know what the time is, and I've just realised I lost track of all these questions online. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Um, it is it is half past, I'm afraid. Um, I don't know what normally happens, Mark. I do. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Um, uh, anyway, it was really fun. I thought really interesting. Oh, thank you, Bill and uh, Susan, for coming. Okay.